Amen. Come on, come on, give the Lord a good hand in the house. Amen. God, our God is a promise keeper. I mean, God, keep, he gives us promises in the Bible, and he doesn't just give us promises in the Bible for the sake of it. God keeps those promises. And that's why we are praying for people who are sick, because we believe God has told us in his word but that by his stripes we were healed. Not will be, but we were healed. That's why we are trusting him and believing in him. That is a God who's able to heal, a God who's able to keep his promises and fulfill them. Do you believe that? I want us to go to God's word because that's what I want to bring to us today because there are people here who've been wondering, God, there's a word you gave me maybe a couple of years ago. I've not seen, come, I've not seen it come to pass. God, I had this promise that I believed you 10 years, 15 years, 5 years, uh, you know, 6 months, 1 year. I haven't seen it come to pass. I want to invite you to the Bible. I want us to look at a story of a man who demonstrates that God not only gives promises, but God is a promise keeper. Come on, say with me, God is a promise keeper. Shout it loud, I know it's cold. Say, God is a promise keeper. We'll be looking at Joshua chapter 14, uh, from 6 to 13. Joshua 14, from verse 6 to 13. I want us to look at God's promise keeping, and then I want us to look at the man's resilience in believing that whatever God has said, he will definitely do it. And we hang on for years and years, believing that God was able to do that which he has promised. If you can hear me, say amen. amen. Joshua 14, 6 to 13. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says, Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country or give me this mountain that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb son of Jephun and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. I want us to read verse 10 to verse 12 together as loud as we can. Do you do that three form? It's on the screens. Three form. While Israel moved out in the world. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself had then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. God is a promise keeper. And, and it's not only a promise keeper, but I want you to understand that God's promises are powerful. Uh, God's promises are powerful because they are our present answers to our present trials. And I say this because when God promises, 
His promises becomes like solutions to the problems that we may face currently or in, or in the future. That when you face a problem or you face a challenge, what makes you stand and be established is the fact that God promised. The strength that the promises of God gives you make you overlook or be able to withstand the challenges that you'd face currently as a person. And that's why God's promises are so powerful. In Psalm 119 verse 15, the Bible says, My comfort in my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. That's Psalm 119 verse 15. My comfort in my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. That when there are challenges, you can rely and hold on to what God said and said, God, I know you said this. And because you said this, I am so assured that even this challenge will not bring me down because your promises preserve my life. God promises guide us on how to pray, on how to stand, and on how to respond to whatever we are going through. That is a challenge. You can look at it and say, God, because I know you promised yesterday, you've never lost a battle, you've always kept your promises, I know even this one you will be able to fulfill. The conditions may not be right. The environment may be speaking differently, but because I want to rely on your word and I want to rely on your promise. Your, the promises of God tell, not only are they a guide to you, but they also tell you what God thinks and is planning in respect of you. If you look at God's promises, then you get to understand, this is what God thinks about me. This is what God is saying about me. The Bible says in Genesis 28 verse 15, God looks at Jacob, and Jacob has gone through a very difficult moment, running away from the brother who wanted to kill him. He's now a fugitive. And God tells him, you know what, Jacob? I will not leave you until I fulfill what I've promised to you. So Jacob could look at the darkness and the difficulties he was going through and hang on to God's word that said, you may go through this wilderness, but God has said he will not leave me until he fulfills that which he has promised me. Listen to a brief background story of this story of Caleb. You see, the story we've read um, uh, in the book of Joshua, the moment in that story captures the period in Israel history when they were under the leadership of Joshua after the death of Moses. They had defeated all the countries occupying the promised land. God had given them victory all across. And they got to a point where Joshua now had to assign or to divide land to the inhabitants of the nation of Israel. And they were doing this through a ballot system to each tribe, the 12 tribes of Israel. And as Joshua is there calling names and saying, you know, this tribe come, you're going on the north, this, name, this tribe come, you're going on the south, Caleb steps to the front and addresses Joshua and says, hey, hold it, Joshua. I want to remind you, Joshua, of the promise that was given me 45 years ago by Moses and God. And you'll find that in Numbers chapter 14, verse 24 through to verse 30. He says, I want to remind you, this is the promise that God gave me through his servant Moses as a reward for being one of the two spies who gave a positive res res result or response. You see, Moses had sent spies to the promised land. And Moses had told them, I want you to go and spy the land and see how it looks like. And, and, and guys went, 12 of them, each one from each tribe. And they came back and gave a report to Moses and the children of Israel. But 10 of the 12 gave a negative report. But Joshua and Caleb came up and stepped up and said, no, no, no. The land that we've seen is a good land and we're able to take it. They didn't discourage the people, all the rest discouraged the people. And, and, and Caleb is reminding Moses, uh, Joshua, sorry, of what they did at that point when they brought that promise, that, that, that positive response from the promised land. And it reminds him that, you remember, Moses, the servant of God, said, he will give me Hebron, the feet where I step my feet on the land of Hebron, that will be mine. You see, the timing then, when he brought that report, was not tried for his occupation. Caleb had to wait for 45 straight years for him to occupy the land of Hebron. It is at that point 
remembering he was 40, he's now 85, 45 years later he tells Joshua, I think it is the right time for me to occupy this land. Give me this mountain. You see, God's promises, if you look at Caleb, you understand, have a tight hold on us. They hook us up. They are unforgettable. They captivate us. They have a hook on us. You don't forget them. How many of you here would say, I've forgotten the promises that have been given in the past? Anyone who say, I still remember some promises that I was given in the past, either by a person, either by God himself. Anyone who's like that? You remember promises? I do. You don't forget promises, especially if they are good and great promises like this. They have a hook on us. They have a hold on us. They are unforgettable. They attract our attention. Our interest is aroused in those promises. And Caleb never forgot. You can imagine the first time he heard of the promise was when he was 40 years. He's still remembering the promise 45 years later when he's 85 years old. Caleb never thought even for a moment that God's promise was a lie. That's how tight a hold those promises had on him. He never even thought for a second that God was lying. He knew that I can wait for all this time and I know God will, will fulfill the promise that is given to me. That's why he looks at Joshua and says, it is, it is time, give me, my, my, give me my mountain, the mountain that was promised to me 45 years ago. There's a man who said, God never made a promise that was too good to be true. No. When God promises, he accomplishes it. He fulfills it. I don't know who I'm talking to today, either online or in the sanctuary. If God has given a word, doesn't matter how long it takes, God is able to fulfill it. God is able to accomplish it. 45 years later, Caleb gets hold of a promise that was given to him when he was young at 40 years old. God's promise appeals to something that is inside of us. It appealed to something that was inside of Caleb. Caleb couldn't get Hebron out of his mind because he was hooked to that promise that God said he will give me uh, Hebron. He couldn't get his promise, this promise, out of his heart. His life was not complete without this. Why? Because to him, Hebron was very important. You may not understand how, Hebron, how important Hebron was until you go back and find out what was this Hebron. Hebron was a high lifted up mountain. In fact, when I was looking at my encyclopedia, what I found out was that it stood about 3,040 feet above sea level. And it overlooks a fertile valley having an unusual supply of wells and springs of water. The guy couldn't forget. I think when he's reminding Joshua, he's remembering how high he was standing and how, you know, how, how green the place was. Not only was he remembering how green the place was, you see, when they came out of the promised land, bringing back the report to Moses, the Bible says in the book of Numbers, they were carrying the produce of the land. They were carrying uh, grapes, pomegranates, very huge fruits. They were so huge that they had, to look for, they had to look for two poles, you know, two people. In fact, no, not just two people, four people to carry, two at the front, two at the back, carrying those huge fruits of the land to go and show the people of Israel and tell them, you know what, this is the produce of the land. Just to get them to be interested and excited about getting into the land of promise. So when jo Caleb is talking to Joshua, he's remembering all that. He's remembering the fruits they were carrying, the produce of the land, how good it was from Hebron. And the man is like, you know what, it's 45 years later, but I'm still as strong. God, give me this land. Give me this mountain. In Numbers 13.23, the Bible says when they reached the valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them, along with some pomegranates and some figs. This man had been captivated by what he saw. He couldn't forget about it. It was all in his mind. Hebron couldn't leave him because of what he had seen. When God promises you, the promises of God have a hold on us, so tight a hold that you can't forget those promises. Not only was Hebron important because of the fruit, but he also understood that this was the place where Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah were buried. So it was a place that had sentimental attachment. 
And Hebron was named by Joshua also as one of the cities of refuge, meaning it was so important a city and a town in the promised land that Caleb, there's no way he was going to forget this place. It was the place where people would run for safety if they got into problems. The promised land, Hebron, had a hold on 45 years later, Heb Caleb still remembered this very important, this very important place. It, it was unforgettable to him. David would agree with Caleb when he says in Psalm 119, verse 103, how sweet are your promises to my taste, more than honey to my mouth. I don't know what God has promised you. I don't know what word you received at the beginning of the year. I don't know what you're trusting him for. I don't know whether you've waited as long as Caleb has. I don't know if it's been six months or a year or two years or five years or ten years. But aren't you invited to join a man who waited longer than you've waited? Because some of us get discouraged for waiting for a week, for six months. Maybe you've applied for, for a job for the last five years and you're like, it's been five years, I'm giving up. I wanted to look at a man like Caleb who waited for a promise for 45 straight years and he was so resilient, he never gave up. He knew that the God who promised is able to do it. The promise had a tight hook on him. Not only are God's promises unforgettable, but God's promises are also conditional. They have terms and conditions. The Bible says about Caleb, he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. You find that in Numbers 14, 23 to 24. The Bible says, not one of them will ever see the land. This is God speaking. I promised on oath to the ancestors. No one has treated me, no one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. I mean, even God testifies and says, Caleb, because he followed me wholeheartedly, I will bring him to the land that I promised. Listen, God has promised. All that God is waiting and is looking up to you to do is that in the 40 some years that Caleb was waiting, would you remain faithful? Would you follow me wholeheartedly? Would you make sure that you, you abide and obey all my instructions? Because sometimes, because of wanting to do stuff very quickly, wanting things to happen very quickly, sometimes we get derailed a little bit. But God is saying, no, no, no. I need you to follow me wholeheartedly. I need you to obey my commands. I need you to obey my instructions, just like Caleb did. Because God rewarded Caleb, not because of anything else, but because the man was able to follow him wholeheartedly, to keep his commands, was able to, to say, you know what? If others will disobey him, I will follow him wholeheartedly and obey him. God does not want us to follow him half-heartedly. He wants us to be like Caleb because he testifies about Caleb. Not only does God testify about Caleb, Caleb was so confident that he even reminds Joshua and tells him, you know what? I have followed God wholeheartedly. I've been faithful to God. That you can stand on that and even remind God and say, God, I've been faithful to you. I have followed you wholeheartedly. Give me my promise. Give me this mountain. Not because of I'm throwing a pity party. Not because I think that my conditions would necessitate for me to be given this because things are difficult. No, 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 God. Look at how I've lived my life. That's what he's telling Joshua. Look at how I've lived. I've been faithful to God. Give me this mountain because I've been faithful. I've been faithful to God. Friends, I want you to know that for every promise in the Bible, there's a premise. A premise meaning for every promise that God gives to you, there's a responsibility on you and on myself to be able to be faithful and committed to the things of God for us to access those promises. The promises of God, yes, are powerful. They're unforgettable. But then the promises of God also are conditional. That God says, there's a responsibility that you have. You've got to follow me faithfully. You've got to walk in my ways. Every promise has a premise. For example, you read the Bible. The Bible says uh, uh, in the book of John, in the gospel of, of John chapter 5, 15 and verse 17, the Bible says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever 
you wish and it will be done for you. Every promise has got an if. It has got an if. There's a responsibility. If you remain in me and my words abide in you, ask of anything. Ask of anything and I will give it to you and it will be done for you. That's what he says in John 15 verse 7. First John chapter 4 verse 15, verse 14 to 15 says this. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will. Now the asking is there, but he says, I want you to ask it according to my will. Every promise has got a premise. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 19 says this. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. Every promise has got an if clause. There's responsibility on, your, on yourself. There's responsibility on myself that you must make sure that you walk in line with God. So you can't go to God and have the confidence that Caleb had when he was facing Joshua and you've not been walking right with God. You've not been abiding in the things of God. The word of God has not remained inside. You can't have that confidence. But Caleb, because of that, he could go to God and say, see how I've lived for you. See how faithful I've been to you. God, give me this mountain that you promised me years and years back. Has God promised you something? Is it something you're trusting God for? Would you walk faithfully? Would you allow his words to remain inside of you, to abide in you? Would, would you be committed to the things of God? And say, I will obey his commands. When you do that, you put God under obligation to fulfill that which he said. Because the Bible says in Psalm 130, 139, is it 139, 130, that says, my word have I exalted above my name. In other words, God is saying, if I've promised, I can re-enage on my name, but I can't re-enage on my word. My word must accomplish and fulfill that which I've promised. But it's dependent upon me and you to say, I will walk in obedience to God. Every promise has got a premise. John Calvin once said, we cannot rely on God's promises without obeying his commands. We can't rely on his promises without obeying his commands. God's promises are not only powerful. God's promises are not only conditional. But number three, God's promise gives, gave Caleb the strongest footing on which to stand. God's promise gave Caleb the strongest footing on which to stand. In other words, you can stand on the word of God. You can stand on his promise. You can tell God like Caleb, you know what? I'm not asking for anything outrageous out there. I am standing on what you've already said, what you've told me in your word. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, he says this, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy. According to the prophecies, prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. Timothy, there are words that were spoken to you. There are promises that God gave you. Timothy, you can stand on the authority of those promises. That's what promises do. They give you a footing on which you can stand on. You may be saying, I don't have a personal promise from God. We'll be seeing that in scripture. All the way from Genesis to Revelation are God's promises to his people. And you and I can stand on them, can find our footing on them. When the terrain is so bad, when, when it's so turbulent that you can't even get a place to, to hold or to support you, you can stand on God's word and say, things are difficult, things are thick, but God, I'm standing on your word because God's promises will give you a footing on which to stand. For example, some of the promises in the Bible, and I'll give you a few. Psalm 29, verse 11. The Bible says, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Things are difficult. There's too much confusion around you. You can hold on to that scripture and say, I can hang on to it. That the Lord gives strength to his people. He gives peace to his people. I can stand on Psalm 29, verse number 11, and wage you warfare on that scripture. That God, I rebuke and I refuse confusion. I rebuke and I refuse disorder. 
I call upon you to give me peace. In accordance to your word in Psalm 29, verse number 11. What about Philippians 4, verse 19? The Bible says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. God, I'm in need today. God, I'm standing on that promise. You said you'll meet all my needs according to your glorious riches. And God, you're not bankrupt. You've never, you've never, you've never lacked anything. Uh, the, the, the storehouses of heaven are so full. So God, I'm praying, would you supply to my needs? I, I, I'm in need of finances. God, I'm trusting you. And I'm standing by faith, holding and waging warfare on the promise that you've given to me. And you can even add another scripture. that God, you've said all a thousand cattle on a thousand hills are yours. So God, you are my provider. And you can wage warfare and stand on that promise of God. I don't know what God has promised you. I don't know if you have a scripture for the things that God has promised you. You can stand on them. That God, I have this wayward child in the house. You can go back to scripture and say, God, you've told me in scripture that train up a child in the way they should go. And even if they depart, they will surely come back. God, I'm calling forth my son. I'm calling forth my child. I did my bit. I trained them and I'm standing on the authority of that scripture. Promises give you a foundation for you to stand on. Has God promised you anything? You can stand on that scripture and wage warfare uh, uh, in regards to the promises that God has given you. Psalm 37 verse 4 says this, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Those are scriptures you can stand on and say, God, this is what you've told me. I'm delighting myself in you. You know the desires of my heart? You know, the, these are the things that I wrote down in January that I gave uh, to the bishop to pray together with me. These are my desires. And Psalm 37 says, if I delight in you, God will give me the desires of my heart. So God, I'm praying uh, for the salvation of my loved ones. I'm praying for my business. I'm praying for my job. God, I'm trusting you for this. I'm trusting you for that. I'm, I, I believe in you that according to your word, God will be able to give me the desires of my heart. Promises give you a footing on which you can stand on. Instead of throwing a pity party and murmuring and complaining uh, that morning when things are difficult, did you take that scripture and hang on to it? Caleb did for 45 years. He did that for 45 years. Uh, you know what you need to do, and I'll give you a few things that you can do uh, in that regard. One is to locate a Bible promise as a foundation to rest your faith. Locate a Bible promise, like the scriptures have given you. Locate a Bible promise as a foundation that you rest your faith and you rest your prayers. God, you're facing difficulty in terms of sickness. Father, you've said in Isaiah 53 that by your stripes we were healed. God, we are holding on to that. We are holding on to that. You locate a scripture that you base as a foundation for your faith and prayers. And I'll tell you something else that you need to do. Once you locate that scripture, Read it over and over until it becomes part of you. In other words, I'm telling you, start to confess it. Memorize it, speak it out. Memorize it and do what? And speak it out. Speak it to yourself. Speak it to situations. The Bible says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by what else? And by the word of their testimony. They spoke out God's word. Look at Jesus in the wilderness when the devil confronts him. What does he say? It is written. It is written. It is written. He spoke back the word of God. You locate that word of God that you'll base as your foundation for your prayers and your faith, then read it over and over again and speak about it. Some of you are going through some difficult moments. Maybe you need to start singing the peace, my God shall, the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding shall be my portion. That's what you need to keep on speaking over and over and over again. So read it and make it yourself. Then fight using the weapon of prayer. Use it as your weapon for prayer. Use it as your battle weapon. That scripture that you've located. Because promises of God will give you a footing on which to stand on. Lastly, God's promises are worth fighting for. So they're not only powerful, they're not only conditional, they are not only the base on which we stand and wage warfare, but God's promises 
are worth fighting for. You've got to fight for the promises that God has given you. And you've said, I may not have it personally, but I've told you in Scripture there are promises all the way from Genesis to Revelation. Hold on to those promises and fight for those promises. You see, in Joshua 14, verse 11, Caleb says this. He says, I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. You think about it. This is 45 years later. When God spoke to him, it was 40 years. Naturally, many of us would give up and say, I'm at 85, let me give up. I am old. But the man says, no, 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 even at 85, I'm going to fight for that which God has promised me. It is not my age. It is not how long it's taken. I will fight for it because it is not over until God says it is over. 85 years of age. There were younger people. In fact, all his contemporaries, apart from Joshua, had died in the wilderness. So this man was, together with Joshua, the oldest in the camp. But then he says, even as old as I am, I am still as strong. And I'm still as vigorous to fight for that which God has promised me. It may have taken long, but I'm going to fight for it. I don't know who I'm talking to today. I'm talking to some people who are giving up in your 30 years. You're 20-something. You're 40-something. You're talking to somebody who says, I've waited for 45 years. I'm still as strong. Why? Because Caleb is teaching us we must fight for God's promises. Caleb refused to fall in the trap that many of us fall into. That it's, it's all over now. It should have happened 20 years ago. It should have happened 30 years ago. I'm old now. I wouldn't even find the pleasure of even standing on that mount. I don't even have the strength to fight the enemies out there. God, it's all over. He didn't fall into that trap of giving up, giving in and giving up because it's taken long. He said, I've waited for it. I've come too far to look back. I will fight for it. I'm still as strong as I was and as vigorous as I was. You see, when you fall into that trap, it stops you from moving by faith and accessing that which God has promised you. Caleb says, now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses. I mean, he kept himself in fighting shape. This is a man who every year at year 41, he was still fighting for those promises. He says, God has kept me alive for a reason and for a purpose. That's why I'm alive today. So the promises is given to me must be accomplished. And that's why I'm not giving in. He says, just as he kept me, the reason he's kept me alive at 45 is so that I can fight for the promises that God has given me. You see, Caleb did not blame God for anything, even the time it took to get to the mountain. Many of us sometimes either blame the environment or we start complaining about God. Oh, God doesn't hear me. Is God really there? If God was there, this would have happened many years ago. But look at Caleb. He refused to blame God. He didn't get to a point and say, ah, if this God was truly the God of Israel, the God of our fathers, would have been able to vanquish these enemies in less than the years we've taken. No, he didn't do that. He stuck in there because he knew these are promises I must fight for. I must go for these promises. I must make sure that I get that which God has promised me. The other thing that we see with Caleb is that Caleb kept his mind alert and fixed on God's promise. And how did he do that? He fought every distraction and every naysayers in the camp. I told you, Caleb was the oldest, together with Joshua. You think about his 45th birthday. Being up the oldest. So there's a bash that has been thrown for Caleb. Caleb is now 40, 45 years. They've cut the cake. They've sung happy birthday. They've given me, him a minute or two to make a speech. I'll tell you the speech that Caleb made. He spoke about the promised land. He told them about the promise that God gave him that has now taken 45 five years. I'm sure the people in the camp were like, ah, 
if it's five years that it's taken, we're sure God will do. We'll be able to accomplish it. Keep on holding in there, Caleb. But you think about Caleb's 55th birthday. He's called the entire family. He's one of the patriarchs in the community. And people have come celebrating his birthday. And what speech does Caleb give? I remember. When I was 40, God promised me he will give me Hebron. I'm sure at that point people have started asking themselves, you know, five years, we could hang in there with you. But Caleb, don't you think we're eating for a long time? It's been 10 years and God hasn't done it. Maybe they didn't verbalize it. Maybe they were thinking it in their hearts and in their minds. Maybe, you know, grandpa, you should give in. You should give up. This may not happen as you were promised. But 55 years could have been young. But think about Caleb's 65th birthday. It's now 20 years. Abash, people are celebrating his birthday. And everybody Caleb is meeting is reminding them, this is what God told him. This is what God promised me when I was 40. It is now 20 years. 20 years. 20 or 25 years, sorry, since God promised me. I'm sure the guys are now wondering, what's wrong with this old man? 25 years, it's not happened. You've waited for that thing for 25 years, Caleb, and you still have faith it's going to happen. Maybe in their hearts they were like, Caleb, if I was you, I would give in. Maybe God's will was different. Maybe you didn't hear him clearly. Maybe God wants you to learn some things about patience from this. Why don't you give up? Just like many of us. It's been five years. It's been ten years. And the enemy or people whisper into your ears. Maybe it's different. Maybe God has changed the trajectory. And, and because maybe you don't have the willingness to fight, you give in. Caleb was not that kind of man. You think about his 70th birthday. 30 years down the line, the man is still holding on, knowing that one day I will get to Hebron. Think about his 75th birthday. This man is still talking about Hebron because he's fighting for a promise that God gave to him. Think about his 80th birthday. It's now been 40 years. They've not been able to take the land, but Caleb still remembers. God said, because of your faithfulness, because of following me wholeheartedly, where your feet will tread, I will give that to you, not just to you, but to your descendants forever. I'm sure by, eight, by the time he was 80, now people were talking to him plainly, verbalizing, maybe even gossiping about him, saying, this man is so paranoid. He's still talking about things he was promised 40 years ago. He's still talking about things he knew when he was young at 40. He's now 80, and he's still holding on to those things. He can't even fight those Anakites. You look at the Anakites. It's not just the Anakites who are there. In fact, they say the three sons of Anak were there three. These were giants who could vanquish any enemy. It is not just the three sons of Anak. They're like, even the Amalekites are there. How will an 80-year-old fight these kind of enemies? How will he be able to get on top of that mountain? But you look at Caleb in fighting shape, who realizes that every promise, doesn't matter how old I am, doesn't matter how many years I've passed, I've got to fight for the promises that God has given to me. He keeps on encouraging himself and says, it's been 45 years, but I'm still focused on what God promised me. Friends, it, was, it had been 45 years, but the man was still captivated by the land of Hebron. How many years have you waited for? How many years? How many years, how many months have you waited for that job? How many years have you worked on that business? How many years have you prayed for that son, for that daughter? How many years have you prayed for that marriage? How many years have you prayed for the salvation of, of, of your loved ones? This man, 45 years, but he was still captivated by the promise of the promised land. 45 years, I did not, you know, give in to whispers of doubt from those who are around him. It was 45 years, but the man still had the will to fight for the promise. I came to speak to somebody who's given up. Given up. Because it's taken long. It's taken a long time. I'm showing you a man in the Bible. It took him 45 years. But in those 45 years, the man still had a will to fight. Knowing that God is able to do that which he has promised. 
You know what happened to Caleb? He still had, had the picture of Hebron in his, in his mind. And every day, that picture of Hebron will stir up faith and hope in his heart. You know, it is like Jesus. The Bible says, when Jesus saw the glory that was laid before him, he despised the shame of the cross. When he saw what was ahead of him, he said, not my will, but God let your will be done. When you see what God has promised to you, you'll be able to fight whatever battle that the enemy throws you away, whatever obstacle that he throws you away. You'll be able to look at it and be like that donkey that said, you know, you throw the soil, but I'll keep on stepping onto it. Until one of these fine days, all those obstacles and the challenges that the enemy throws at me will be like my stepping stone to where God is sending me. I came to tell you, don't give up. Come on, church, I came to tell you, don't give up. Don't you give in. Don't you give up. Keep on pushing. It's been one year, two years, 10 years, 15 years. The God who promised is able to accomplish it. Numbers 23 says this. If God, God is not a man that he should lie. Has he said it? It will surely come to pass. Has God promised you? It will surely come to pass. You can fight for those promises. Don't you give in. Habakkuk chapter 2, I think verse 3 to 4, talks about the vision that Habakkuk was told to write on a plate. And the Bible says, write it on a tablet that it may be plain. And then the Bible says, though it tarries, it will surely come to pass. I came to tell somebody today, it may have tarried, but the Bible says it will surely come to pass. Come on, it will, be, it will surely come to pass. It will come to pass because the God who promised is able. The God who promised is able. You see, Caleb knew it would take time and force to drive out the Anakites from Hebron. That's why he kept himself in fighting shape. Why? Because Caleb understood that the devil would want to dispossess you of you, what God has promised you, so you've got to fight for it. Did you know anywhere God was sending the children of Israel, it was not a barren land? They were Amalekites or the Gigashites. And God was like, you go in and take over that land. There are spaces, there are situations, there are environments that God has promised you. I will tell you, there are Amalekites in there. That's why you need to fight for those promises. You need to fight for those promises. There are enemies in there. It is not open territory. It is occupied. And God says, don't you be intimidated by how big they are. Don't you be intimidated by how fortified the city is. Would you go and fight? If a man 85 years old could fight, I call upon you. This week, would you, go, would you fight for that? Don't you give in. I mean, you're in that office, you're in that job, and you're being intimidated by a few people, and you're feeling like, I need to quit. Don't you quit. Stay put. Stay put. Stand on God's promises. And say, you know what? Even with the Amalekites in here, even with the Gigashites in here, I'm going to fight for what God has promised me until it comes to to pass. The enemy will not give you anything for free. Will not even allow you to take it for free. No, you've got to put up a fight. The Bible says the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. You've got to be like that Caleb and say, you know what? I'm going to go in. God, give me this mountain. Give me this mountain. I want to fight. I want to fight. I want to take that which God has promised me. I want to pray for you today as I bring this to a close. You that is saying it's taken long. God says, I promised I will fulfill it. You've not waited for 45 years like Caleb did. It could have been just two years or 10 years or 15 years. God says, did I promise? It will surely come to pass because our God is a promise keeper. Would you stand together with me? Caleb was resilient. He was resilient. God plays his part. He says, I keep my promises, but he needs you to be resilient like Caleb was. He's able to do it. 
is able to accomplish that which is promised. I want to pray for you. You're saying, I've waited for long. It could be that business, or I've waited, it could be, I've waited for a child for a long time, or I've waited for a job for a long time. Lord, the battle has been so intense. I've waited for the healing of my marriage for a long time. I want to pray for you. I have about five minutes for me to hand this mic back to Mike. But I'll ask you to come to the altar. I feel in my heart I just need to pray for you here. Just come to the altar. Come, come, come and stand here as we make this prayer. And we believe God by faith. I have waited for long. But I've been giving, I, I'm, I'm on the verge of giving up. But I'm learning from Caleb. 45 years, 45 years, resilient, I can hang in there. God is able to do. He is able to do and to accomplish that which is promised. The Bible says he's not a man that he should lie. Has he promised? Has he said it? He will fulfill it. Habakkuk reminds us, though it tarries, though it tarries, it will surely come to pass. It will come to pass. And I want to pray for you that this will be like Caleb, your 45th year. That you can look and say, God, give me that mountain. Give me. This should be that day. They give me now that mountain moment. God, I thank you because you're a faithful God. Come on, church. I want you to stretch your hands to the front as we do body ministry today. God, you're faithful. God, you, you've never lost a battle. You've never given a promise that you cannot keep. Lord, we stand together with our brothers and sisters. Some have waited for star for a long time. Almost at the verge of giving up. Father, we pray that you'll start up hope and faith in their hearts. And we pray that may this day, may this moment be the Caleb moment. Give me that mountain. Give me that mountain. That God, you're turning around. You're turning around. You're healing businesses. You're changing fortunes in the name of Jesus. You're healing marriages, my God. That from this point, like Caleb, we'll come back with a testimony. That on this day, God, we, had, we still have the energy to fight and take that which you had promised us. Some have waited you for long for, for children. My God, I pray, open those wombs. Open those wombs. Open those wombs. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. For open doors that have been stubborn for a long time. Father, we command those doors to be open. In the name of Jesus. We come to the altar by faith, knowing that our hope is not in men, but our hope is inside of you. The Lord, as we stand here, we are declaring that God, you are able. So Lord, we pray, you who is the God of the turnaround, would, would you cause a turnaround amongst your children right now? Would you cause a turnaround? A turnaround, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that as we get into a new week, will this week be a week of testimonies, of things that you've done, fortunes that you've changed, things that we had forgotten, that Lord, you brought them back, and turn them around for our families, for our lives, my God, for our children, for our jobs, for our marriages. My God, thank you because you're doing it right now, because you're a faithful God. So we declare victory today. We declare victory today. We declare victory, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus. Mambo, makubwa zaidi ya tuomba yo Unaweza kutenda Unaweza kufanya Mambo, makubwa Saidia tuomba yo 
taken time for 10, 15 may be compressed into one day and may you experience that miraculous power in your life, in Jesus name Amen Amen, may God bless you May God bless you